Okay, because we're talking about some serious business here. Now, Jeff is one of our instructors for month two. Now, this boy... <laughs> yeah, so Jeff's been with us on the tractor workshop and other places. And Jeff is going to teach with us. So I think the biggest deal for um, what we want to go over the, on this call... So I'll hang up this Facebook stuff and just do the phone. Just uh, get you oriented a little bit on on how we're going to operate. So it's all about all of us learning and teaching together and by virtue of the modular design methods and free CAD uploads, downloads, collaborative process, um, making it really practice and get a lot of practice in um, empowering a group process to, to get spectacular results, kind of almost like cultivating group genius, where part of the design is that I'm going <clears> to <throat> participate only as much as I'm needed because I need to start transitioning this to where other people can do it, not just a few superstars uh, that's effectively working on getting myself out of the picture or documenting myself right. out of the picture so that this can actually scale. Because if that doesn't happen, uh, there's only so much I can do. And it's very clear as time goes on that we're after collaborative design, and that means it's about inviting a large team. So in a process, so you, you're an instructor, you're going to have, who's going to be with you? Jessica, Tom, and also Gabe. Gabe was um, involved in Apropedia. He's good on process. I would say for you, you're, you're pretty good on um, definitely hands-on skills and running the, the shop since you've got a lot of experience in that. I think you did right. well last time when we did the tractor workshop in terms of one doing some of the hands-on work and also teaching others to do so, showing people how to do it. So I, I trust your skill set on that, and I've seen it. So that's pretty good. Uh, that's a lot of fun too. <laughs> yeah. So oh yeah, we're gonna have some fun during the summer. So already there's three yeah. people signed up. Uh, we're we're getting that like really pushing out the final instructor lists and and publicity for that. Uh, just to clarify the, the value proposition and get a lot of people excited. Uh, basically, pitching it as in these three months, you'll probably get more skill set in diverse diverse areas than you probably would in a lifetime anywhere else. So, uh, the way so so my role in the morning, I'll do design design review as well as uh, some teaching on some of the the universal design principles like of all the different modules that go into this but pretty much after that it's mm -hmm. we're all we're all prototyping stuff between CAD between rapid prototyping on 3d printers CNC torch table uh, and building that whole infrastructure by the time you're there we we should um, po probably will have the larger printers we'll have the torch tables mm -hmm. we'll have the the 3d printers so so rapid iterations using those tools are going to be a lot of fun um, Maybe I can I can stop a little bit here and and ask uh, any questions that you may have regarding like from what you saw in a video with Benoit, who is one of our uh, students. Uh, any, mm -hmm. any anything that comes to mind at this point? Um, no, I I know from the workshop before it seems like um, a lot of the partic participants that come are strong on the software side and <clears throat> not quite so strong on the on the hands on side mm -hmm. and that's where i i look forward to teaching that because that's a lot of fun i'm i'm a little i have some background in uh, you know, I, I used to program in basic and pascal in the 80s so a yeah. long time ago but I'm, I'm not as i'm not up on all the current stuff in the software side but i do love the the building yeah so i think we're gonna have a lot of fun with that yeah yeah we are we are. And I'm excited about that torch table. That's, yeah. Uh, that's something on my list that I want to build myself. So. Yeah. No, definitely. A, uh, I think that's up and fully fully developed for mass, for wide-scale wide scale replication. I think we can see a lot of take-up of our material as well with for mm -hmm. the larger machines. Yeah. So that would be, be really mm -hmm. good. Um, so some of the skills... Uh, just to go over like the process, tell me, Jeff, you know, what do you know about how the process, the development process, how do you understand that's going to run? Because I think the, the biggest value I can contribute is outside of providing, uh, just kind of explaining where all the libraries are and guiding that process of finding where all the past work is, 
um, mm -hmm. I can pretty much do well to guide the process and then you guys pretty much prototype as a, as a really collaborative team like we're really trying to push right. that as you as you know um, so how do you maybe you can tell me like since since you're gonna be an instructor and you've seen a little bit of how we work how how do you see this happening like what, what's your picture so that we can keep cultivating it and how that workflow is gonna go well I know when we built the micro track the last last version uh, <clears throat> the design was pretty much already done when we started so we were taking that and running with it mm -hmm. uh, we had to make some changes as we went because designing on paper or on computers there's always some differences in between right so you always have to <clears throat> modify as you go yeah so uh, do we plan on doing that again having the design done ahead of time or are we going to do that as we're uh, in during the 90 days as always yeah. the answer is both so we have the okay. last design to build on and mm -hmm. what we generate beforehand is what we we can work with now we can okay very well do any upgrades during the workshop be, during the summer now before then it would be interesting to once once there's a maybe a few more people that are signed up I would like to mm -hmm. see a couple of design, design sessions where on one side we practice the process and on another mm -hmm. side actually contribute to the part libraries. So mm -hmm. as we get closer to the event and more people are signed up, I would like to see a couple of like even, even just introductory sessions. I definitely want to have a, uh, like probably like in the next couple of weeks have all the instructors meet. So there's three times three uh, plus two plus two or three. There's about 12 or so instructors that are going to be <clears throat> on the team. Uh, we still actually mm -hmm. need to find the community manager. Uh, so we don't have a community uh -huh. ma manager hired up for the, the summer. We've got nine, nine instructors altogether. Uh, so we've got mm -hmm. Chris, Chris, William, and Michelle for the first month. You, Tom, Jessica, and, and Gabe. Tom and Jessica will do two, two, two weeks in the second month. And then for the third month, we have Katerina, Gary... And Jessica for the full month there, so we were stacked with that. But we'll, let's get a meeting on a, mm -hmm. on a calendar, like in a couple of weeks, so we can all coordinate and kind of uh, maybe before that go through some more material. Okay. But because part of it is how well we collaborate with everybody, we're also going to have um, we are opening it up to to some remote participation, people who want to uh -huh. uh, contribute to the design in in some ways. So so there's going to be both the on-site and global community. And by the way, the the mm -hmm. process for this, if this goes really well. I'd like to see um, multiple locations summer of extreme design build 2021. <laughs> so oh, just, yeah. just like awesome. we have now taken the steam camps to multiple locations, mm -hmm. uh, what our interest mm -hmm. is in is in large collaborative process that can really. Uh, sorry, because because we've got a little bit of work done on <laughs> to to do on. The, S some more stuff right. to do on a global village construction set where I call it like 33% done, but that's like really with uh, there's another whole level layer on top of that, which is the enterprise and that we have very little uh -huh. of. So, so there's a lot of work left on, uh, on the uh, global village construction set. And these, these routes from the steam camps to the summers to the incentive challenges, which we're, we're going to plan on running as a regular program. We're trying to really accelerate mm -hmm. our development. So that's how it looks. Um, what else on a, on a second month there? So you, you asked if, we're going to have design to work from versus generating it. We can build on the modules. So probably what, what is expected is when we start on a micro track, we might take a couple uh -huh. of weak points and improve them. If there's any weak points uh -huh. that we decide we need to improve. Now, one, one weak point or modification is going to, uh, to the Changfa diesel. And I think that's a very good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically for the longevity so so part of the design work i mean you know if you can you know up to the workshop can keep looking into that but basically before the workshop i mean we're gonna have to actually source the parts and so make some decisions on exactly which model we take from what supplier because there's probably a good amount of research that goes like you wouldn't know any people that know about the chankfa diesels would you or do you know any people that sell I them or I'm, i don't I, I mean i've read the other powers yeah, um, website for years, 
and I'm, there's been some mention there, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know anybody personally that, yeah. that has used those. Right. I, uh, for my own stuff, I uh, I got a hold of a uh, a greens mower that has a um, 37 and a half horse Kubota diesel. And I, I picked that up, and I was going to use that to build some stuff at the house with it. But Kubota is expensive, which is the exact reason why we were looking at going with the chunk foot diesel. Uh, is the Kubota um, multiple cylinder, or is that one cylinder? Uh, it's three cylinder. Three cylinder, yeah. Yeah, so we wanted three to... Three cylinder diesel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we wanted to go to chunk foot. But maybe um, that's one of the discussions we can have, like maybe if we can... Uh, you're on the OSC Workshops Facebook page. We can maybe like post some stuff there and try to shake down a good supplier that we'd want to go with. You mentioned about mm-hmm. around the 30 horsepower range, and I'm in on you with mm-hmm. that. Like if you get like up to even the 37, or I think that's like some some of the bigger ones. But then again, mm-hmm. with that, there's going to be issues on part sourcing more than like right. I think there's. The other slightly smaller ones, like 27 or 24, are kind of like the most common, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to make that decision because really uh, what I see happening there is using those for some time and until we make those ourselves, so that means precision precision CNC of which we will start. We will start with, during the second month, we're going to move into the 2-inch and 3-inch universal axes. So meaning the super, mm-hmm. rather heavy duty stuff, which gets you like a few hundred pounds of force or mm-hmm. like close to like a thousand pounds of tool force with like sub thousand deflection on a CNC machine. So yeah, that's going to be p- part of the development. And as, as much as that program takes off to really shaking that machine down, that's going to pretty much mm-hmm. determine how quickly we're going to get to actually making our our s- cylinders for uh, engines and stuff like that and and maybe we just mm-hmm. go hey um, I could envision seeing something like blocks um, where we get things like the injector pumps which are pretty precise but then again the injection pumps are much smaller so probably with precision grinders we might be able to make those mm-hmm. and not buy them off the shelf but as far as boring cylinders mm-hmm. that's not particularly heavy you know particularly complicated um, as long as well, you've got... a lot of times they use liners. Yeah, liners, liners. That's the answer, right? So there. you so you would take in board yeah. and then you'd press in a liner. So the, the yep. I I drive the big eighteen wheelers and their their engines have uh, sleeves in there. You, yeah. You knock out a sleeve, put in a new sleeve, and then it's a brand new engine again. Right. Exactly. And that's kind of kind of the model. Like if we can get to. Uh, we're going to innovate, of course, and possibly I could I could envision a, a 3D printed engine block because we're going to run get the mm-hmm. the 200 amp or larger welders on a CNC gantry to make substantial 3D prints in metal, full metal. Mm-hmm. Um, now that potentially gets us to near net shape, which we then machine out to 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 house the cylinders. That's not a far cry. Mm-hmm. That's that's something we can. Uh, potentially get into now I, in your email you mentioned oh yeah you know engine making that's a big deal but i mean we got to start somewhere and we know that right. people have made en- engines since 1800 so uh it's a question of getting some initial prototypes and getting successes but yeah we got to open source this stuff because it's 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 important well, any, anything when you break it down to the most minute detail is simple it's just when you, you get all the the assemblies together, it gets complicated. But right. if we break it down to the mi- the minute thing, it's simple. Exactly. So. Exactly. And and the ideal thing to accelerate that process is as we go along. That's why I'm publishing like a high school 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 girl on on Facebook and everywhere else regarding what we're doing here, <laughs> because we want to track. <laughs> you know, we we publish these videos, and one one at one time maybe uh, a qualified person actually sees that and say, hey, I can help with that, and. That's how we attract the people. Right. Basically, by communicating that and getting the publicity out there, we're looking for for the people. And a lot of times, it may not be your your um, your expert from a university. It might be someone who's more hands on, like you or me. Um, mm-hmm. The non um, the non academic types, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that um, we we pay attention to other things. Because a lot of times, the people with the formal training are 
quite prejudiced against doing things a certain way, and I actually s seen a lot of that. Right. So, um, you know, this is an invitation for anyone who's listening to to really um, join a team and and help us design things like the engines. There's a lot of people that do make do have the necessary skills and. It's about mm -hmm. creating a platform to do that together. Eventually, like with, I, I'd say, so So this year we're running the incentive challenge on a cordless drill. But later on, I could see like the next one I was kind of thinking in a rollout, maybe for the year after, okay, it's going to be the, the incentive challenge on the, the micro tractor or tractor. Then after that, ooh, mm -hmm. how about the engine? Ah. So once we right. prove out how it works on the cordless drill, we're going to open up a lot of opportunity for rapid development on the more complicated things. So that's kind of... I envision that. I know at, at one years back, I I was interested in the steam engines. The steam, steam engines right. looked like they were doable to build um, on a do-it-yourself basis. Yep, and they were simple. And it, it's been so long now, I don't remember all of the, that stuff. But mm -hmm. it looked like it was something that was doable. And I know that there's yeah. people in that space that have done it. Yeah. So. Yeah, and actually, you know, talking to, I've been to a couple of the Steam Steam Camp, not the st Steam Camp, actual Steam Auto Club of America meeting, different Steam, mm -hmm. and um, the running word there is that when you have a steam engine, it's essentially as complicated as, uh, you know, the good ones, they're as difficult to make as regular car engines, so that technology mm. is definitely transferable. If you know how to make a steam engine, you can make make a car for a car engine. Uh, regular right. internal combustion yeah well but, mm -hmm. i know that i've read some of steve chastain's stuff and uh he's a, based in florida mm -hmm. he's a mechanical engineer and he uh, he does uh restoration of old cars like the pack cars i think pack cars is the name of it um packards yeah the old packards and it, they don't make the parts anymore so he cast the, the parts he makes molds, casts the parts, and and then he machines it, and that's how he he puts together the engines. Shades classic he's cars. Cast. Is that? Yeah, he he restores the old you know cars from the the twenties, the thirties, old old ones that there's no, it's impossible to get parts for, and he just makes all the parts. Right. So, the, yeah. Yeah. So people like that. Now, someone like that that has that experience would be ideal for for this. Yeah, I've never. I've got a couple of his books on my on my What's shelf. What's the last one name? On, uh, uh, Chastain is C H A S T A I N. Steve it's Stephen Chastain. Chastain. Uh huh. Oh, oh, that's good. Oh, that's the guy. Uh, have you found him to be collaborative and open, or not really? I've I've never had any communication with him before. I've just I've purchased a couple of his books, uh, one on generators and inverters, where he he took a a, a a little diesel engine and he he modified it and turned it into a generator, and he goes through in the book how to how to do all of that, and then another one is alternative energy secret secrets mm. that he. He's got some books on the metal casting uh, uh, using cupolas, but mm -hmm. I, uh, I haven't uh, purchased those books. I haven't read them, but I have read some articles that he's written. Uh, if you remember Lindsay Publications, whenever yeah. they used to be in business, uh, he was one of the authors that that Lindsay published. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I've read some of his. I've read all of Dave Gendry's, uh, the books that he used to write on, on the metal casting and making in your own machine shop from scratch. Same thing, or just basic principles. You boil it down to the most basic thing, and then you build it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I've done a little bit of metal casting. That's, that's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I'm seeing the books like Metal Casting Volume 1 and 2, Iron Melting Couple of Furnaces, Small Foundry Furnaces. Mm -hmm. is, is that all his work? Yeah, yeah that's all his like work. It. Yeah. Um, and then some uh, he, of the... Let's see, uh, does he, he make any his, uh, engine uh, books also? Let's see, books. Build a motor. Uh, generators and I don't inverters. think he's got any... Uh, mm -hmm. 
Well, he, his uh, generators in, and inverters book, it goes into how to modify um, an engine, uh, an existing engine, mm-hmm. in order to make it into a, a generator engine. And he goes through how he, he cast all the different parts, and he made his own um, uh, uh, bell housing for for the uh, ring gear to go in for the starter to couple it up to a generator head and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, which that's quite a bit. He made a um, uh, his water cooler things. I think he made an intake manifold for it as well. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure. Yeah, I'm looking here at the book right now. He made an in- intake manifold on it. Yeah, and he really gets into the uh, the engineering side of things. Mm-hmm. He goes pretty deep into that. Yeah, yep. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, yeah. So in general, regarding the subject matter experts like that, you know, keep your eyes out on and anyone listening to this, keep your eyes out on people who are collaborative because ideas like are the people willing to share their information openly there's obviously books and resources but mm-hmm. yeah but can we actually interest for example Steven on collaborating on steam camps you know or other ways where we're collaborating mm-hmm. at a deeper level like him as you know having all the skill sets is he interested in diversifying into more digital fabrication does he enjoy learning that in exchange for teaching us about engines as an example Mm-hmm. Well, I'll, I'll try to make contact with him. Yeah. To see what yeah. he has to say. Yeah, that that would be great. Um, it's it's always that uh, just trying to find the people that that are quite willing to collaborate and really interested in learning new things, as we always do here. Um, so, mm-hmm. so Jeff, regarding the some of the process of collaborating through throughout the summer so the main things is uh i think you have a log if not i I i'll set you up to that uh let's see jeff i don't have one yet okay need to set you up on that um and any um the most practical thing to do is so one you're getting the printer so you'll start getting familiar with that uh i'll send you some links to all the build information we have but okay you know so you're going to get practical experience there but otherwise, like the, the idea just to get it in your framework, framework of the mind, you see what everyone else on a team is doing, like, like you saw in a video with Benoit. Uh, we basically mm-hmm. start our logs. We upload and download constantly from the wiki. So we got to get familiar with part libraries and how to create them and how to upload and download continuously and without also getting to edit conflicts, which means that as soon as you have something, pretty much upload it because... Uh, the wiki is open, open, uploadable. You can upload at uh-huh. any time. We don't lock anything down. Like typically, you have a design process where you lock stuff down, and one person works right. works on it. Here, it's like it doesn't uh-huh. matter because one, we're dividing, like you said, divide a thing into many, many pieces, and many people can work in parallel. That's the kind of workflow we'll be we'll be doing between like hands-on skills. You'll be teaching a lot in a shop. Then we'll be spending the probably like the morning would be design, and the afternoon is build. Uh, build time mm-hmm. where we're prototype. So what I'd like to see is actually so with your 3D printer, the thing you can get pumped up for is before we build the next micro track, we're gonna build a scale prototype. So probably one that's 3D okay. printed uh, with electric motors uh-huh. and maybe like a quarter or eighth 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 scale, so that we don't get into any like I know that on the li- last micro track, you know there were issues like on some of the fits fits of the different things. Right which you were there, so you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that we can all work out through scale prototyping and 3D printing. Uh, we may, I'm mm-hmm. not sure if we will have a laser cutter for, we will have at least a very small one, like a few watt, which can cut little paper models. But anything mm-hmm. we build, like the general rule is uh, second Toyota Paradox. Do you, do you see that link? If you didn't, go to Benoit Log. Um, I think I yeah, put let me, it there. Let me try to get on there. Um, I think I put that link there. <clears throat> oh yeah, it's in there. Look at uh, look at his log, and it's linked from the video. Should uh, link to his log entry there. 
Oh no, I didn't. Let me link to his log on the video itself so that when people see this, um, edit this. See more links from conversation at Benoit Log. Yeah, so if you even go to the YouTube video, you can. There's a link there I added to to his log. So basically, the thing you okay. have to master is understanding. Okay, where's everybody's stuff? So you know Benoit is. Mm -hmm. What's the page title on the wiki where his log is? Say it. Come on, you can say it. Oh. Are you talking about Benoit Log? That's right. Yeah, and L is capital. We, we use capitalize the first letter of everyone. But yeah, Marchin Log, Jeff Log, uh, Jessica Log, Tom Log, everybody. Uh, so you'll be able to find that immediately. But of course, they'll be all linked from um, like a control panel page that we set up. But that way you can coordinate with everybody. So that's the main thing, just uploading things, just keeping track, not just like put random stuff in your log, but put links, links to real work product. If you worked on a CAD file, mm -hmm. put the link right there. Now that kind of stuff where it's easy. Like think about, okay, if I'm working, the, the mindset is I'm not working myself. If there's like a bunch of people working with me, what do I need to make it easy for everybody to work with me at the same time, whether they're even at the steam, at the summer camp, Summer of Extreme right. Design Build, or they're remote. Because ideally, we'd have enough remote participation that people can collaborate on the, on the prototyping, especially if they have 3D printers. They can actually build the scale models. So that means upload, upload, upload as soon as you have something. That's kind of like the general rule. We call it the 60-second rule. As soon as you get it, just upload it and then upload any major change, any change that you're making. Because think that there's many others that are looking at this and that can collaborate if they have the asset and the asset must be digital, right. they can download it and freak out and open it up. So that's kind of how we work. Work logs. Then in Google Docs, we, we basically do the latest, the most recent page on top so that people can find relevant, relevant material. If there's a working doc, like we'll work, throw the, the main uh, page or thing that we're working on to the very top so it's easily visible, that kind of thing. Um, so you'll get uh, the 3D printer. You know, like what would be interesting, maybe like one good test for your printer would be to take what we have uh -huh. on the micro track already because we'll, that will be our starting point for the micro track. Uh -huh. S print it, print a scale model, and see if you can actually, uh, you know, say you make a if you get to iterating on any design changes, then print it. That that would be like the first thing to do, print it as a scale model. Um, so I would like to see a process where we're actually making two versions. One is the real, uh, the prototype. That's the physical metal build. And what if we actually productize the actual toys, the, the scale models? That could be an awesome education toy for like a steam camp or even to sell as a kit to people who want to uh, design and learn how to design with FreeCAD and prototype with our printers and stuff like that. So, so we want to actually operate at the level of, okay, we're producing definitely the final product using rapid prototyping and a process where we constantly prototype part by part whether it's 3d printing or other means um, but we can think think literally that we can productize the scale models as well so if we put a battery pack uh -huh. and, and little electric motors we may have the next the the 3d printed electric motor by that time so michelle is working on that so uh -huh. uh, and if not we can get motors off the shelf um, but ideally we have a version where one is for pro rapid prototyping uh, using uh -huh. electric battery packs and electric motors for a small model and then we have the real deal for the life-size machine um, so so we have to think about it as whatever we test once we actually go to the final build which is at the end of each month we'll have like one or two builds um, like uh -huh. major builds which we actually treat as extreme manufacturing workshops that we can can invite external audiences to uh, at that point yeah it's all out a lot of fun and sparks flying and stuff gets done in rapid time but we've tested a lot of the parts we can't do that without testing like what you've seen before is right. we didn't really test uh the the right. we didn't do as much prototyping as built. needed we just build it now oh. we're going to have much more time and much more people so we can spend the time prototyping the different elements of it and make sure everything goes together right mm -hmm. yep that's a good idea yeah so then also so if yeah 
Go ahead. Uh, one, question, one question I have is, so if we use the the chunk of diesel, there's a lead time on, on order. Oh, yeah. So is that something we need to to get a get a fix on what we're going to do engine wise and then yeah. get that on order? Or? Well, yeah. I mean, see, for that, we can be talking about some significant lead times there. So that's something like, so we're going to get into the diesel engines July 1, right? So June is not, we're not going to touch uh -huh. the diesels too much. We, uh, we're doing a micro factory on the first month. But then on the engine uh -huh. and life size machines, that comes in July 1st. So I would say, like, we make the order uh, probably two months before then, like for the cutoff. Like, if we want to get a few of them, right. like, I'm probably thinking of several, like, up to five or so. Um, uh -huh. Possibly possibly even more. Uh, the determinant will be how many people we have signing up. <laughs> uh, <All right. laughs> basically, how many can we afford? Now, the idea there is like if we get a whole batch, it's probably like, like say ten of them. Is, it'll probably be as cheap as getting is, five, if we buy it like yeah, a whole the, order. I, I think I saw something like three or four hundred dollars if there was ten, versus eight hundred dollars a piece for right. individuals. Yeah, so. exactly. So, I'm kind of looking at okay, let's spend some time determining which exact model we want. Uh, so maybe mm -hmm. like Jeff, in any spare time you have, like keep looking into that because we need to make a good decision. Let's let's actually start a well. We have a wiki page called the Changfa Diesel. Um, let's go there. Um, we should set up a work. Yeah. So there's OSC case. Uh, there's a bunch of videos and links there. Let's set up um, like for now. Let's let's just set up an as a, as an exercise right now. Just do one exercise here. Uh -huh. Let's go to. Um, let me pull out a template and actually start a working doc there that you and I can get in there. Can you <clears throat> edit on Google Docs right now? Um, I don't know if I can go to Google Docs. Well, we will see right now. So I, I'm, I'm taking a presentation template, making a copy of it uh -huh. right now as we speak. So I'll do a chunk for diesel selection a working doc. So you can't see it yet. I'm not. And then I'm gonna paste that into. So maybe I'm gonna do jet log. Yeah, you actually. Let's see. Who is this? View history. Um, Jeff Adams. Different. Please. Man. Um. So how do I? How do I get into the the wiki for? Yeah, me, so so log the... in, which is the upper right hand corner. Okay. Uh, we... Tuesday, February eleven, twenty. Uh, I'm not on the wiki. Not on the wiki yet. Chang the diesels. Yeah, and in the meantime, like we'll what we'll do is we'll practice like editing between wiki, your log, your time log, and edible Google Google Docs, so that by the time the Steam Camp comes, you're you're fully up to speed on all those workflows. Um, but let me put a working doc at the top of the chunk for diesel page. So what I'm doing is working doc, and you can actually so I'm recording this video. Um, so you can take a look at this. Okay. Uh, so how I did yeah, I'm it. Not able yeah, but basically I I'm go. I'm not able to see yours. No. I'm on. Right now, what I'm looking at is Benoit's log. I've got I've got that up, but I'm not in the same thing that you're in. Right. So let me um let me see if I can share this with you right now. Um. Because the cool thing is actually you don't need to log into the wiki to click edit on an edit, editable Google Docs within the wiki. So let me see. Let me see if that works for you. Uh, 
Okay, have you created a log for me yet? Yeah, it's a Jeff Higdon log. <clears throat> so there you actually can be taken to the to the Chang for Diza. I put that link in there. Click on the edit there. Okay, so I've got Jeff Higdon log. Says there's no text on this page. Um, can edit, hold on. Let me, um, oh, did I? Capital H and capital L. Are you doing capital H and capital L? Uh, so I did it. Jeff Higdon, uh, uh, capital J, E, F, F, and then capital H, 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 I, G, D, O, N, then underscore, and then capital L, O, G. Is that... Do you have Higdon, Jeff Higdon log? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's it should be there. You should have uh, Jeff Higdon log, Tuesday, February 11, Chang for Diesels. Are you seeing it? Refresh. Refresh on Jeff Higdon log. Huh. It's on my end, it's showing... Okay, so it's Jeff Higdon log, but it says there's currently no text on this page. Then one of us is misspelling Jeff Higdon, because I just created the, <laughs> the Jeff Higdon page. Um, who, which one of us is it? Let me see. Let me type in. Okay, so slash wiki. Yeah, so if you go like slash wiki slash Jeff Higdon log capital H capital L okay so uh, got the wiki slash J E F F capital H I G D O N underscore capital L yeah but no space between Jeff and Higdon <clears throat> and I have no space between Jeff and Higdon yeah huh. man that is so weird so uh, here I just am sending I just sent you a link by email click on the link okay and tell me what went wrong That'll work. so yeah so yeah, now I'm in the chunk the diesel log selection criteria uh, easy to source parts and easy to source engine um, low cost naturally like we're talking like when we get a bunch of these we're talking <laughs> they're ridiculously cheap at 300 to right. 400 but there's no way that could be produced like that in the United States until OSC that, gets that cost. Uh, starts a business uh, correct <laughs> um, correct and uh, the the thing is shipping, but if you get that on a pallet, it's only going to be like five hundred. What is it like five hundred bucks or a thousand or? Yeah, it's uh, well. Uh, I've shipped to the United States, and it's it's like five hundred dollars for. Uh, I can't remember what the two hundred fifty pounds or five hundred pounds. Might be five hundred pounds. Yeah, I think a pallet is like. 500 on a cargo ship or something 500 or a thousand or what is it uh, I, sh I shipped something to Hawaii one time so I shipped it by freight from Louisiana to Long Beach California and then I had to put it on a shipping container and take it to Hawaii and it was $800 mm -hmm. and it was something that was Wow, uh, a little bigger than a, a little bigger than a pallet. It was a, a carpet cleaning machine. Yeah, with a, yeah. A wastewater wastewater tank on it. We should be able to do like five hundred to a thousand dollars for a pallet from Guangdong, China, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, let's take a look at. It. Did you get that link? The link hasn't come through yet. Ah, there, there it is. Yeah. So Chang, so click on a Chang for. Click on the link to the Chang for Diesels. Oh, uh, okay. There, it had the um, had the underscore in between Jeff and Higdon, so that was. Oh, uh, uh, but that still was. should work. I'm not okay. sure why. Yeah. I'm not sure what you did there, because I I got it spelled. Well, right. what it, you had it spelled correctly, but I didn't put a space in between Jeff and Higdon up. 
Oh yeah. Okay. I, I jammed the words together. And okay. You had an underscore. Okay. Good. So, that, so, we, so space. That's so that's okay, one of so the now, rules. Now I'm on. Yeah. I'm Chank, on Chank for diesel. And then underneath the dock, what do you see underneath the dock? There's Chank for diesel log. Um, click edit under the working dock. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm in there. Did you click edit? Yeah, there you are. So now you can edit that. Now you can copy and paste and do everything there. So so let's let's talk about it. You can actually edit that. So so please go ahead. What are some other selection criteria? Um, let's see. Let's see how I maneuver this thing. Yeah. So so what you want to do is get really familiar with these Google Docs where you can draw shapes mm -hmm. in there and then copy and paste. It's really useful. You can make hyperlinks and do text, basic sure. conceptual design. It's um, that's good. Um, so yeah, we we probably want to break it down to like requirements. Um, I'll do a slide, new slide, or just a slide, duplicate slide, so that the branding is copied. Um, so breakdown, like what are the requirements for like the, some of the main requirements, like what okay, are the, a, the pump uh, requirements? Uh, you would need to know what the uh, what the horsepower requirements are for the pump, which yeah, that means what's your what's your volume that you're needing to flow for the the pump, what pressures you need to run. Yeah. Um, um, let's let's work on page one there with some more requirements. So um, make sure like what are the critical pieces? Make sure that critical components components can be sourced can be sourced reliably. What are those things? So cylinder so so your liners. cylinder liner, your piston, uh, your rings. Your valves, um, injector pump, injector pump, um, um, and then your your rod and your crank, rod and crank. Um, <clears throat> does it have any? Do do any of these have any electronics outside of? There's just Not charging. That I've right? seen. No electronics, so that's good. Um, uh, it, it would be better not to have, well, typically, uh, like my Kubota uh, diesel that I've got, uh, there's no electronics required to make it run. Right. There's no, uh, once you crank that motor, there's no electronics running anything. Right. There's just a electronic fuel shutoff switch, and that's how you kill the motor. You, you kill the fuel to it. How do you kill the motor on a Changfa? Uh, I'm not sure on that. It would either, either you would kill the fuel or you would kill the air, one or the other. That's how you stop them. Kill fuel or kill compression, or no? Right. Uh, yeah, probably you could. Compression kill. release? Does it have that or? Uh, there might. I I don't know if they have a compression release or not. I, I went through a bunch of them and I would think that they would. Yeah. Because they were, they had the option of hand start or. Yeah, yeah. Um, they would. Or electric, and with hand starts, you have to have a compression release. Yeah. Have you t torn an engine apart before? I've, I haven't torn a diesel engine apart. I've, re uh, I've rebuilt uh, several engines, and I've done lots and lots of mechanical work on, on vehicles. So when you say rebuilt, and when I, what does that mean? Uh, uh, I took in an... Uh, Pulled the head off, pulled the, the, the pan off, pulled out the crank, the camshaft, pulled the, uh, the rods and the pistons out, replaced the rings, and uh, uh, reassembled it. Took the, I took the heads in, had a machine, replaced the, the valves in them, the things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I, I did uh, a lot of that I did when I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, um, from 14 to 19, I had 46 cars. All right. I would take, 
I would take and buy junk cars, and I would fix them. Oh wow! And then I, and then I would swap them and and uh, get another set of cars. Wow. So I, w- I would get I would get families of cars, you know, like I would get Toyota Corollas or or Honda Civics or uh, Ford <coughs> uh, Ford Fairmonts or or uh, Mazda pickups, you know. And I would get families of cars that either body parts through the interchange or motor parts would interchange. Yeah, interesting. and then I would. I would combine the cars together into one good one. Mm. And I, I was a kid, and you know, I, I didn't know anything. I just dug into them. And sometimes I, I completely trashed the thing, and it was ready for the junkyard when I got done. Yeah. But I learned, and then I, I was able to get them. To, I was able to take them apart and put them back, back together reliably. That's, and by the time I was late teens, I could do a head gasket change on a on a Mazda pickup and uh, it took me an hour to get it apart and an hour to get it back together. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's really quick. Yeah. Yeah. But, Cause, uh, uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. So you've got the experience on that. So for the, the present Changfa, like most likely number is probably four. I, I want to have four at least cause we want to build several uh-huh. power units for different things. Uh, but probably, uh, eight, or 10, like would also sound like a good numbers, in which case we can get the bulk order. So probably like 10 might be the number to get. And if they're really like 300 or 400, that's like 4,000 or 5,000 for that whole shipment, which would give us a lot of material to prototype with. Um, but right. we do want to make sure that, like how do we do this? Can we get like a sample? No, nah, I mean, I don't know if we can get a sample. Um, yeah, that would be hard. We... Because that that will add up probably as much I, cost as like half the shipment. Um, mm-hmm. I, so maybe like I haven't found any source for any importers that do that. Yeah. I I, I did some Google searching on that, and I was not able to to find anybody that's importing them. And one question I have is, uh, like the um, the Lister diesels. Yeah. So they. They stopped importing them because they didn't meet the the current requirements on a, right. on the on the emissions. But you can still import them, but you import them as an air compressor, and then you then you buy the parts and you and you change it over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, but if we're going to make a product, then we need something that we could could purchase and then uh, put in there, and it would be legal to to use. But what I, are their I was looking through it. I it, it looked like there was uh, ones that were saying that they were were meeting the requirements yeah. for the current current emission standards. So yeah, so so that should be doable. Yeah, yeah. So we should say uh, meet emission standards because otherwise we can get ones that don't, and they're just prototyping devices. Right. But so let's say it's acceptable to use non-certified um, engines for prototyping mm-hmm. and I mean I'm really thinking the way things are going right now we should be able to have access to to building these within probably like two years I think for replacement if it's like mm-hmm. replacement parts at least but hopefully the whole engines right. via 3d printing so um, yeah uh, a lot of it will depend well, the, on the success of this summer because I'm I'm hoping to get a really robust 3D printer and metal uh, as a result mm-hmm. part of the result of this summer. Yeah. Uh, well, I know that there's been work in the past for uh, for building plastic engines. I remember that was back in the 80s. That, plastic. Uh, popular science or pop, uh, popular popular science or popular mechanics had a uh, an article on it where they had built an engine from plastic and used uh, metal liners really the, the cylinders mm-hmm. did, I, did I those work or... since it. they had working prototypes from what i re- recall uh so but, how did they address cooling did they have some funky mechanism for cooling or was it pretty standard techniques it 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 looked like a conventional engine it was uh, like a v8 engine or huh. uh, v6 or v8 engine that's interesting but I, uh, I haven't 
I haven't seen anything else on that. So, I mean, when you think about it, you got to have pretty high temperature plastic in order to, well, yeah, to not For the... get into trouble. You got your typical engine runs at about 180 degrees so, Celsius. Uh, I know Fahrenheit. Um. 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But there's going to be hotter parts, so that's not a problem for, that's not an issue for a lot of plastics. But what about like the hot right. spots by the right by the, the cylinders? How, how uh, hot are I think those? that it was using, I think it was using a a combination of um, of plastics and ceramic. Yeah, the ceramic can take the heat. So the the head itself, uh, that would. The head, the cylinder, and on the top of the piston—that's where your your heat's going to be. Yeah. And then your exhaust comes comes off the head, so the head would probably have to be metal. Right. But, but potential, but potentially the block could be plastic, uh, provided the design was bro robust enough. Wow, <laughs> I didn't think about that, but that's that's. Yeah, that's it, compelling. it potentially could. Because by the end of the summer, we should be having the ability to, to do high temperature plastics that go up to like PEI. Um, see, but that's only, PEI is only like 178C. Uh, uh -huh. But that's it's before it's, it's glass transition. So 178C uh -huh. to Fahrenheit. We're talking 352 Fahrenheit. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, if if everything goes as planned, we will have printing ceramics, but that's just like clay that you can fire. But that's not the kind of ceramic right. we're, we're talking about. But actually, mm -hmm. like, are some of those high perf performance ceramics are those printable? Like they come in a paste form that they then bake, or how do they make those? I know, uh, I know that I've read that of. 3D printing ceramics, but I haven't read anything about the makeup of the ceramic. Yeah, What's yeah, because the there's a way where bodies. we can definitely do ceramic printing, but then you bake it, and then, yeah, yeah, I actually haven't looking, looked much into that, but there's definitely uh, some possibilities there that we can think about, because even if you mm -hmm. have metal parts simply that are insulated in a clever way from the plastic geometry, that could work. Uh -huh. So that's an interesting concept but yeah something to think about um yeah. but in the meantime yeah yep go ahead uh, oh no I, I was just thinking of, on, on what you were saying on that i know that, that uh, when i worked in aerospace my my boss who designed airplanes he designed a, a race car engine from scratch um, yeah from nothing yeah. and he uh, he had problems with with the engines blowing on the on the racetrack, so he designed a uh, an engine that was completely milled from aluminum. Yeah. So it was a four cylinder motor. Everything was milled on CNC. That was incredibly expensive, though, because yeah. you yeah. he used billet used billet aluminum, and billet aluminum is not cheap. Yeah. Yep. Oh. And that's something that, of kind of stuff like when we talk about making our own billet. That would be something doable. And um, mm -hmm. tell me, so tell me for the Changfa, you said we, the the evaporative cooling won't work because that's too much maintenance? Yeah, I, I, it seems like the, that um, in a stationary unit, like if you're using it for a generator, then uh, what a lot of times what they'll do is they'll just take a... Um, like a 55 gallon drum yeah and they'll put a, a a bung in the bottom and a bung in the top and they will just cycle the, the water through there to cool the, the engine and because it's it's under just a steady load all the time not uh, not rural heavy load and it's in a shielded environment that tends to work but in a, uh, whenever you're working an engine then you've got the potential to get a lot hotter like I drive 18 wheelers and going down the road, uh, my truck runs 180 degrees. But as soon as I climb a hill, it goes up to 210 degrees. Yeah. So it's a, it's the same thing if if you've got a 
a micro track or skid steer or bulldozer or whatever, and you go to pushing dirt so that you're you're really putting it under a strain, that temperature is going to shoot up, and I think that's where the evaporative cooling would fail. Mm-hmm. So I think the water cooling would with a fan would do a lot better in that. Yeah. So I pretty much have to plan on radiators for these, so a radiator addition. Right. But, right. Yeah. And then to scale them, because we talk about modularity, so we can possibly do it where we've got, we talked about the mother power cube, which has all the um, those cooling and oil tank, uh, like a hydraulic fluid tank. So maybe we can do one mother power cube with a solid cooling system and then run uh-huh. all the cooling off of that for several engines if we're doing stacking of power cubes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so something like that is what we probably... That will be a good strategy so we can scale this. I'm looking at ZS, ZH 1133, 33 horsepower. That's prob- that kind of looks good to me. Um, it looks like those what? are... So I'm looking I at... Had a, uh, off I had a tank. skid steer. Yeah. Yep. I, I had a skid steer that I, I just sold a few months ago. It was a, a Ford um, CL40, and it had a, a 40 horsepower uh, little V4... Ford engine that powered it, and because of the V4 configuration, it actually had the about the same torque as what the diesels have. Normally, the diesels have better torque than the gas, and that was just about right. And it it had power to uh, to uh, to push. And I've I've operated some that had 20 horsepower, and it was it wasn't enough. Right. right. So I'm I'm thinking that it. In the 30s would be sufficient. Yeah, that would be a decent, really good, decent uh, force mm-hmm. level. Something you can do, uh, you can do a sufficient work with it. Yeah. And then yeah. of course we can we can still parallel yep, yep. engines. I, I yep. think you've done some of that before. Yep. Yep. So. Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah. So so our next step is yeah. Think about uh. Yeah. Let's let's wrap up here. So. Continue on. How far did you get on free? Did you open up FreeCAD again, or I uh, want to get you practicing in that as much as we can? I've, I have FreeCAD uh, 16 installed on this computer. Yep. So maybe uh, go so, through the lesson one, two, and three on um, on the FreeCAD page. I can send you the okay. links. But what you want to do is basically get to the uh, the exercise where you draw a 3D object, a feature on it that 3d object and the feature on that feature there's a basic workflow there and you should be able to do that like once you get it get the hang of it but take a look at that video uh the freak out one two and three that's like the Uh next step and in the meantime just keep looking at uh the chank for diesels and um we'll call a meeting with all the instructors to get on the same page uh the last thing is uh, okay i also wanted to to check in with you on any marketing ideas to attract more people and so forth. Do you have any ideas on that? To what to, how to go about that? Because we we want to attract a lot of people for the summer. Any any thoughts on that or? Well, well, I I was thinking um, of what uh, what's the ideal person? Yeah. Who who does who's typically attracted to this? Um, I mean, I'm 50 years old, so I'm. I'm older now, but typically I see young people in their 20s that uh, that perhaps have a a tech background, but they've never done too much with their hands, but they would like to. There's a a lot of people that uh, that are um, that grew up in families that that they went to college and they uh, and they've done the tech. They've never changed oil in a car. Yeah. They've never done basic things, so I think that that's probably where the the market would be is for twenty something year olds, maybe early thirties even, that are in the tech sector. But how to attract them is a good question. Um, yeah, I, I grew up doing I grew up doing everything, but I grew up poor, so that was the reason why I learned how to do everything. Is yep. that if I wanted to do something, I had to, to figure it out. Right. So I became a generalist, and I figured out how to do just about anything that I wanted to do. Right. But I, 
uh, I know I've seen that with the young people where they they have the the software skill set, but they don't have the the hands-on skill set. So, I guess the question would be: Is where do they hang out? Where where where's their place online that you could go to and and um, and talk to them at? And I'm not. Uh, I use Facebook, but I'm not up on all the different social medias. I never use Reddit and things like that, so I don't know. Maybe there's a technologists for. Uh, technologists for hands-on skills group on Facebook <laughs> technologists mm -hmm. for hands-on skills Facebook group no nothing comes up on Facebook okay um, there's a hands-on technology transfer Inc on Facebook yeah we'll keep doing it yeah I've um, thinking a lot about that and Again, uh, doing the final announcement. So I got your picture and bio, I think, so that's good. But I might ask you to, like, in a promo video for it, um, uh -huh. maybe, maybe uh, throw in a line. You have a cell phone camera you could do and get you on a yes. get you on a pulpit? Sure. Okay. Might ask you to do something. But, yeah, so let's let's uh, let's call the day for here. And, yeah, yeah, glad to have you. That would be great. I mean, you really have the – Hands-on skills. It'll be a good match with uh, Gabe, who's who's got a lot of the organizational and open source software skills, and then Jessica and Tom. So I think that would be a good second what? month team, and then of course me piping yeah. in as much as I can. Um, but yeah, that sounds good. So we'll, we'll be in yeah. touch, and your printer should be arriving pretty soon. So you'll get the hands-on of building, and at that point, as you get familiar with FreeCAD, we, maybe we can start start you on doing some small-scale prototypes. Um, of okay. the next micro track that would be awesome because we never really did the scale okay. prototyping yeah right okay i think that's a good step yep yep okay okay jeff well good to well, talk to you and we'll keep checking in that's good all right well, good to talk to you and you have a good evening yep jeff thank you take care then okay. Bye bye bye